want to uh, thank everyone for, for joining us today uh, in this new uh, COVID world that we all live in, but I'm so thrilled to see so many of you, you here. Um, this is our 14th annual Frederick Lee Lectures. And before I, uh, I introduce Dr. Warshauer, I'd just like to thank the Madison Foundation for the generous financial support that they provide. They have supported us for the last uh, three or four years, and we're so grateful for, for the funding that they provide us. And for those of you who have uh, been a part of the Lee Lectures for, for many years now, you may recognize Dr. Warshauer. He has spoken twice before here at the Lee Lectures once on the War of 1812 and then another time on the Civil War. So uh, Dr. Warshauer received his BA in History from Central Connecticut State University. Hang on, I've got one other person coming in. He, um, he got his uh, bachelor's in history in 1990 and then uh, got his PhD in 1997 in American Studies from St. Louis University and he joined the faculty of CCSU later that year. Um, there was a, a cute quote on his biography online and it reads, if you had told him at the time that, uh, of graduation in 1990 that he would return to his alma mater and build a career, he would have thought you were crazy. But lucky for us, he did in fact return to, uh, to Connecticut and uh, we are all the richer for it. Um, his first book, Andrew Jackson, and the Politics of Martial Law, Nationalism, Civil Liberties, and Partisanship was published in 2006 and was widely recognized as one of the newest consideration, considerations in many years of Andrew Jackson and received favorable reviews in major history journals and The New Yorker. Uh, he followed up this publication in 2009 with the publication of Andrew Jackson in Context. He served as editor of the journal Connecticut History from 2003 to 2011. Sorry, let me just let someone else in there. He, um, and this expanded his scholarly, scholarly focus on Connecticut state history. In 2011, Dr. Warshauer published uh, Connecticut in the American Civil War, Slavery, Sacrifice and Survival. Um, and that was described as an account that puts political parties and questions of racial policy at the heart of Connecticut, Connecticut's wartime history. Someone else is coming in. His most recent publication, which is Inside Connecticut and the Civil War, Essays on One State's Struggles, was published in 2014, and it is actually a collection of essays written by current and former master's students in the CCSU Department of History and he edited that publication. So Dr. Warshauer is a dedicated teacher who views every class, according to his biography, as performance art and an opportunity to engage students. He is recognized annually on the Excellence in Teaching Honor Roll at CCSU. He's a recipient of the 2006 CCSU and Connecticut State University Faculty Research Awards and was awarded in 2012 the Bruce Fraser Award in Public History by the Association for the Study of Connecticut History. And that was the first time the award was ever given. Uh, in 2011, he also received the New England, Teachers, New England History Teachers Association Kidger Award for Innovative Publishing and Teaching. So he serves on numerous committees and boards throughout the, out Connecticut. And it is my honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Matthew Warshauer. Thank you, Jenny. I hope everybody's doing well on this, uh, this at least sunny winter afternoon that we have. It's always good to work with Madison Historical Society. Uh, we, and I mean uh, the history community, especially Civil War Commemoration Commission, we've done a just, we did a ton of work in Madison uh, during the Civil War Commemoration from 2011 to 2015. We held two fantastic uh, commemorative events at, at your beautiful Bower Park there. And uh, so Madison is a, is a very neat place, very special place, and a, a really very, very cool Civil War history that is connected to Madison. So if you don't know any about any of that stuff uh, and you're a lover of history, look it up. It's, it's, it's some pretty neat stuff. So what I am going to do is I am going to share my screen and I'm actually going to take my view off of uh, the screen so that you're just looking at the PowerPoint. So like Jenny was saying, uh, the, the best thing to do is view your, put your screen in speaker view rather than gallery. So that rather than seeing everybody's picture there, 
you can see just the PowerPoint because I've got a great PowerPoint that's got a lot of really, really neat information in it for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Matt, can I just quickly tell everyone to please keep, uh, stay muted. Please do not have your microphone on because then it creates background noise. There we go. And I am going to just check with my video. All right, there we go. Uh, so I hope you can all see uh, the, 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 uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, the title of this talk is Connecticut's Sweet Tooth, Sugar, Slavery, and the West Indies Trade. So with that, we will. All right, so uh, the, the story of Connecticut's trade goes hand in hand with the story of, of population growth. Uh, one of the things I've also done in the past is I've done uh, some pretty neat talks and PowerPoints with Connecticut maps. And here you have one of the, the fairly old maps of Connecticut, which was created by Moses Park. And you can see you know, what they did. You can obviously see Long Island Sound and the importance of the rivers and then uh, some of the, the, the counties that are there and uh, the, the basic development by 1766 of Connecticut. And, and we know that um, the English first really start to settle in Connecticut in the, in the 1630s uh, with, with Hartford and Wethersfield and, and, and Windsor. And, uh, you know, when people are first coming over it, to Connecticut, it, it's really about, you know, the development of a colony uh, for the British Isles. And, you know, this is all pretty basic stuff that I, that I know all of you know, but when people are first coming over, it really is uh, a, a sort of subsistence style uh, economy where people are just really trying to survive, though every colony is designed to be a, a source of, uh, of, of, of profit ultimately for the mother country, as all of the early colonies along uh, in North America are, um, they, they, it takes them time to develop. And that first hundred years or so uh, is really critical to the, uh, the, the stable establishment of various towns that become cities and go along with Connecticut's population growth. And here you can see that, you know, as I said, 1636 is the beginning. Um, within a, a, you know, just a few years, you've got 1,500 people who are living in the state. Within 20 years, by 1660, that increases significantly to 8,000. By 1680, another 20 years, um, that has uh, more than doubled. By 1700, again, you've increased it by almost 10,000. And then when you get to the 1720s, you really start to see a rapid increase in the population of Connecticut. And that has to do primarily with, uh, with immigration into the colony. There is, of course, natural increase by people living in in the colony and, and you know having children and expanding, but it's really still a lot of immigration that's coming in. Uh, and again, you, when you look at 1740, 1760, 1780, you can really see the numbers shoot up. So by the time you get to the 1760s, you've got a, a well-established enough colony with a large enough population and enough towns and cities and, and critically, roads and the use of, of rivers to start to be able to move products. And so while most of the colony, most of the people living in the colony is still primarily subsistence, they are yeoman farmers, they are producing basically everything it is that they need to survive. It is not yet a truly market oriented economy where people are, are producing goods specifically to sell on the market uh, and you're, you're basically developing a more sort of what we would understand today as a capitalist sort of economy. A, a true market economy doesn't really take off in a big way until 
you know, the eight, you know, early 1800s, really 18 teens, 1820s, or really after the War of 1812. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a certain degree and a, a certain significant amount uh, of trade that's going on. And the story that, you know, we're looking into today is the trade that the colony of Connecticut does with the West Indies. And we're talking about the West Indies broadly, the islands of the Caribbean. Uh, we're not talking about just the British Isles, though that is of course important because English colonies are able to trade with English colonies and there's not as many trade restrictions uh, by the crown and parliament and whatnot. But uh, we are also trading with, with other colonies that are in the Caribbean, in the West Indies. And that includes you know, the Portuguese colonies and French colonies and Spanish colonies. And so uh, while there, most farmers are producing for themselves, they are also producing some surplus to, to get some cash as well. And so, uh, you know, early on, the people of Connecticut are merchants. You know, I, I, you know, I was just talking about the, the mid 1700s, but, but early on, they are thinking about how to make money. Uh, as early as they can. And as early as 1649, uh, merchants from Wethersfield and Hartford, and these are two, you know, when you, when you think about the, the three original towns, and if you're familiar with the Connecticut state seal, you see the three grapevines that are on our state seal, on our flag. Those grapevines represent those three towns of Wethersfield, Hartford, and Windsor. And I'm not going to get into the debate of which gets to claim to be the first Connecticut town. They all argue about that and have ever, uh, ever since they were founded. But they, they, Weathersfield and Hartford decide, you know, they're not that far apart, and they decide to invest in the building of a small vessel, which they call the trial, meaning to, it, it's a trial of trade with the English Isle of Barbados, uh, which had been settled in 1627. And the, the trial sailed out of the Connecticut River, and it was loaded with fresh farm produce, lumber, and barrel staves. And the staves are those wooden vertical uh, slabs that are used to form a barrel and they're put together with a, with a hoop. Uh, and so this is the very first attempt by uh, those in the Connecticut colony to engage in trade. And so from this very small beginning, um, a prosperous trade developed between Connecticut and the islands of the West Indies. Uh, and the way that we know this is by looking at custom records. Uh, and they indicate trade relations between colonial Connecticut and the popular English islands of Barbados and of St. Kitts were particularly strong. And I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, uh, you know, Barbados is much closer to North America than St. Kitts is. St. Kitts is about halfway down the island chain, sort of smack dab in, in the middle of, um, of uh, the Caribbean Sea. Uh, and its sister island is, is Nevis, which is a place that I am uh, very, very fond of. I've been there many times. My, my mom actually owns a house there. Uh, and it is where uh, Alexander Hamilton was born. So this West Indies trade is something that, that begins early on, but it's not until the 1700s that it really, truly takes off. Uh, and the, the success of the trade between North America and the West Indies was based on the introduction of sugar as a cash crop. Sugar is the big cash crop of the West Indies. Uh, it was originally native to Polynesia. Uh, it was brought to the Canary Islands, to, from the Canary Islands to the West, to the West Indies by Columbus on his second voyage. Uh, they also grew uh, tobacco and cotton uh, were tried as cash crops, but sugar, uh, in, until Eli Whitney develops the cotton gin uh, in, in the late uh, 1790s or mid 1790s rather, uh, sugar is really the cash crop. Uh, or tobacco and cotton, yes, cotton especially with the, with the cotton gin just takes off and becomes the major cash crop of North America. But for the islands, uh, it's always sugar because the growing uh, the climate there is so perfect for growing. And here you can see in the image, one of the old sugar plantations. And you can see the hut to your left is, you can see the little wisps of smoke. And these are all little individual fireplaces that are underneath this, this structure. And then they have these giant copper kettles. And if you've ever been down to the Caribbean, you'll see these copper kettles around where 
they cook, they, you know, they, they, you, you can see over to the right, uh, you can see a gigantic press. And what they do is you have, a, you have a, 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 an enslaved person on a, a, a little sort of wheeled structure that has an oxen and he is, it's, it's riding around in a circle. And what it's doing is it's crushing the sugar cane and the sugar cane, the juice drops down into that trough and runs down to the cooking area. And they cook down the, the sugar juice, the cane juice until the juice evaporates and it then ultimately dries and leaves the crystallized uh, brown sugar uh, that we know as raw sugar. And this is a process that, you know, if you go down to the Caribbean, you see sugar ruins, you know, just on every single island. So when sugar really starts to take off and the, the, it, it starts to command incredible prices, what planters do is they say, those living on the island say, you know what, this cash crop is so valuable that it is far more cost effective to plant every possible inch of the island where you can with sugarcane. Forget growing uh, fruits and vegetables to feed yourself or your enslaved people. That it's easier, it's a better cash uh, business proposition to grow lots and lots of sugar, sell that at an incredibly high price, and then purchase off island anything else it is that you need. And that includes um, all kinds of different food from, uh, you know, as I said, uh, fruits and vegetables, as well as livestock. So, you know, chickens, hogs, uh, cattle, horses, goats, everything. They are not raised on any of the sugar islands in the Caribbean. They're all brought in from outside the islands. And if you go down to these islands, and as I said, I've been to Nevis just you know dozens of times, it is a five mile by six mile island, that's it. But when I go down there, I look at it and today it's much of it is rejungled. Uh, but I always imagine it back in the 1700s when virtually every inch of that island where sugarcane could be grown, that's what was growing. And I've explored the island extensively and I have found um, sugar mill ruins where the foundations are only left, literally way, way up the side of the island, up into the mountain area. Nevis actually looks like sort of like a sombrero. And you can see um, in the bottom picture on the bottom right, you can see a large mountain there. But Nevis has a 3,200 foot mountain on it, which, you know, you know, the top of the mountain is often enshrouded in a cloud and they would, uh, plant sugarcane as far up that hill on the way to the mountain as they possibly could. So you got to imagine if you've been to the Caribbean, every inch is planted with sugarcane and therefore there is no room to grow anything else. And it's not cost effective to grow anything else, but it doesn't mean that you, you, you know, you still have to have food, right? And that means that the main source of what they're bringing in or everything of what they're bringing in is coming from outside on board ships. And the main source of that supply comes from New England and specifically from Connecticut. It is no exaggeration whatsoever to say that Connecticut as an agricultural producer was absolutely critical to sugar production throughout the West Indies. And Connecticut was so instrumental to that sugar production, it was more important than any other colony in North America and really any colony in the world, uh, any British colony, any, any colony from any country. Connecticut is just, I can't overemphasize the degree to which Connecticut's economy steps into this role of being able to develop uh, a, a network that provides all of these supplies to the West Indies. It, it's really quite remarkable. So uh, a voyage on one of these vessels took anywhere from two to five weeks, depending on the weather uh, and the port of call, how far down in the West Indies they're going. Generally ships had to visit a number of different islands to sell their entire cargo. So they're sort of bouncing around from island to island and selling their cargo and taking either 
uh, uh, cash or most likely, more likely, in exchange, they are taking sugar or molasses or rum in exchange. So it's a barter, more of a barter economy than it is a cash economy. These vessels range from anywhere from 60 feet to 150 feet. Uh, most of the livestock that is brought down is kept on deck rather than in the holds of the ship. And I'll show you some images of that in a little bit. But um, this is, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking about um, before you have GPS, global position satellites that tell you exactly where you're going. Um, this is the time of, of wind and sail and understanding uh, the, the sky to read the stars, to know exactly where you're going and understanding what trade winds are like and what currents are like. And this is uh, not for the faint of heart. And if any of you have ever sailed, uh, you know, I once sailed from Puerto Rico to uh, North Carolina on a 53 foot sailboat. And when you get out there and you're on a 50 or 60 or even a hundred foot boat, uh, and there's no land in sight, you feel awful small and, and rather insignificant and vulnerable. So this is, this is quite a venture. Uh, these are seafaring people. Uh, uh, Governor Joseph Talcott, uh, who was, you know, his, his years of birth and death were 1669 to 1741. He was the 26th governor of Connecticut. Uh, and uh, from, from 1724 until his death in 1741, he's actually the very first Connecticut governor who was born in the colony itself. And if you look to the left, you can see a slab that is, uh, is his grave marker. And if you've ever been up to Hartford and seen the ancient burying ground up there, uh, this is where the, uh, his body resides. And then you can also see what it says on the top uh, there uh, down the bottom. And you can also see his signature there. And I think those are just sort of neat things to include. Uh, and so in 1731, when he was governor, uh, he, he reports that in the entire colony of Connecticut, there are only 44 trading vessels that had a total capacity of 456 tons. And I, I want to reemphasize that again. So when I was talking about, you know, in, 16, in the 1640s, the trial, that, that first ship from Wethersfield and Hartford makes this first attempt to go down to, to, to the islands. It's almost a full hundred years later that Talcott is reporting, well, now we have 44 vessels and we're carrying 456 tons. Well, as the colony, as I started with, as the colony's population grows and with it, the, the development of the colony itself and the stabilization of the economy and the, the trade develops along with it. And so by the time you get to just 30, 40 years later, the number of vessels, so we're in the 1770s, the number of vessels has quadrupled and the total tonnage has multiplied by, by more than 20, okay? So this is really an, an extensive increase in the 1700s as I re reiterated or referred to rather before. So on, on January 4th, 1771, uh, a 33-year-old captain named Dudley Salstenstall sailed the schooner Fox to the West Indies. Uh, and he's a great example of the kind of things that they're bringing down there. Below deck were, were barrels from Connecticut farmers. Uh, and it included fish, onions, beef, pork, cheese, corn, and oats. Uh, alongside were wood products like hoops, hogshead staves, and pine boards. Uh, courtesy of the men working the many sawmills dotting the Connecticut Thames and other rivers across the colony. And again, if you've been to the Caribbean and you look at the islands, you know that there, there's not a, a, a gigantic abundance of trees to provide the, the wood, the building materials down there for what needs to be created. And when you come into uh, North America and in particular Connecticut, we are heavily, heavily wooded. And there is, uh, along these rivers, the Connecticut, the Thames, and others, there is a, a very, very well-developed uh, wood and lumbering uh, facilities that develop. And it's not just for exporting wood materials to other places, but it's for the shipbuilding endeavors that are going on in Connecticut. And you think of a place not far from you like Mystic, which is a shipbuilding hub, uh, hub 
lots and lots of wood from all around Connecticut is being brought to Mystic and being brought to uh, other coastal towns and cities that are developing ship industries. Uh, additionally, on, on the Schooner Fox, there are 14 horses corralled in a makeshift wooden stall. Uh, they comprise actually the most valuable item. These 14 horses, you know, all the stuff that was on there, fish, onion, beef, pork, all this stuff that had been put into these barrels, it's the horses that are the most valuable. They accounted for 46% of the entire cargo. Uh, also on board were 11 oxen. Uh, combined, the livestock on board the Fox was worth almost 59% of the total value. So as I had said earlier, it, it's all of these agricultural goods, but it's also domesticated animals. They are tremendously, tremendously valuable uh, in the islands. So in 1774, uh, you can see here uh, Connecticut's governor, Jonathan Trumbull, a very famous governor, uh, fantastic hairdo, uh, a, a stern looking uh, puritanical uh, looking guy. Uh, he surveyed the trading dynamics of the colony and arrived at one conclusion. And this is 1774. So again, think about what uh, you know the earlier governor had said and just 40 years later, Trumbull's conclusion is the principal trade of this colony is to the West India Islands. And so we've already developed by 1770s this significant, significant trade. He then states this included not only the British Islands, but a trade with the French and Dutch West Indies. Those vessels that go from hence to the French and Dutch plantations, Trumbull wrote, carry horses, cattle, sheep, hogs, provisions, and lumber. These ships brought back in exchange, so this barter economy, they trade for molasses, cocoa, which develops chocolate, uh, cotton, and some sugar. Okay? And sugar and molasses are the key ingredients uh, for rum. The trade was officially organized around two ports in Connecticut. Uh, one is New London, which was the larger of the two ports and New Haven. And the, well, the real way that we can tell all of this information is from the custom records. Custom agents recorded the number of ships clearing and entering. Uh, they made a note of every single ship, where their destinations were, what their tonnage was, and what their cargoes were. And the reason that the customs agents kept such uh, you know, really good records, not all of the records survived, but the records that we do have are very, very intricate is because that's the way that, that the British crown uh, made its money off of the colonies was through uh, customs, was, was uh, charging duties on imports and exports. So uh, local shipwrights operating in yards at New Haven and New London had by 1774 produced a fleet size Trumbull estimated at 180 vessels. And this one, the ones owned by locals alone. This is not trading vessels from uh, other colonies that are coming to Connecticut. These are 180 vessels that are owned by uh, men from Connecticut. Um, and they have a carrying capacity of 10,317 tons. So, yeah, I mean, again, you know, I keep reiterating this point, but it's, so, it's such an important one this incredible expansion that occurs over a 40 year period and, and then even more over a hundred year period. Uh, Trumbull says that the, these, the ships were manned by 1,162 seafaring men, not including the additional 20 plus coasting vessels that employ about 90 seamen. So what he's talking about, uh, the, the 1,000 men are, they're seafaring men. They're going way out. They're going down into the West Indies trade. Some of them are sailing across to Europe. And then there's also a coastal trade of smaller vessels that are just moving along uh, through New England Sound and maybe up a little further north up into Massachusetts. And so uh, the maritime commercial trade in Connecticut had risen dramatically since the previous inventory in 1762 when the local fleet numbered 76 with a total of 6,000 
700 tons operated by 601 seafaring men. So you're talking about, you know, 12 years and it has uh, expanded exponentially. Uh, and so understanding what Connecticut exported, and this is what really is key here. There is a set of records that are called the Inspector General's Customs Report, 1768 to 1772. It covers a five year period. And it's the only complete data set of imports and exports. Not all of the, the customs reports have survived, but this particular set of five years is, is really key to understanding what this trade was like. And I, you, you can see here in the, the middle of the slide that I mentioned Professor Eric Bartholomew Kimball. Uh, he wrote a doctoral dissertation uh, called An Essential Link in a Vast Chain, New England and the West Indies, 1700 to 1775. Most of the figures and charts that I'm gonna show you that follow this slide come from his doctoral dissertation, which is really, really good. It's available online if you're interested. Um, uh, if you don't have a minute to jot this down and you're really interested, you can shoot me an email and I'm happy to send you the title, uh, even the link to it. It's actually, as far as doctoral dissertations go, um, it's actually really well written and very, very fascinating. And I, I think it's just fair to give Eric uh, credit where credit is due because it's really a, a, a very, very good uh, piece of work. So and so here, here's what we have. So exports to the West Indies during this five-year period from 1768 to 1772. On the left side, you can see this is information for New Haven. Uh, the West Indies were the largest and most significant export market for ships clearing from New Haven between 1768 and 1772. 444 ships representing 43% of the total number of all vessels cleared for the island, okay? So there are 444 ships that go from New Haven to the West Indies. That represents 43% of all the ships that ever leave New Haven. So there are ships that are going other places, but a significant number, almost half are headed to the West Indies. And of this, 18,090 tons go to the West Indies. That accounts for 56% of all the ships that travel from New Haven, okay? Uh, that is a significant amount of goods. When you look at New London, which as I said earlier is the larger port, we're talking the same period of time from 68 to 72, you've got 1,870 vessels left New London, 792 of them are bound for the West Indies, very similar to New Haven, New Haven was 43%, 42% of all the ships that leave New London are headed to the West Indies. Uh, in addition, the 30,175 tons from New London headed to the Caribbean represented 56% of all the tonnage. So it's very, in, but the percentage wise, it's very similar to New Haven. This again is, it's just a massive amount of the percentage of goods that are leaving these two principal ports. These are the two key ports of Connecticut, okay? That have the deepest ports, uh, protected areas, um, the most developed cities or, or large towns that are there. And so goods from all over Connecticut, from the interior of Connecticut are coming down rivers and are headed to these two ports where they are put on board vessels, the majority of which is going down to the Caribbean. And so this last chart on the bottom is almost as much tonnage went just to the West Indies from New London as left New Haven for all ports combined. So what that means is the, the, the amount, that 30,000 tons that's going from New London, that's more than, or almost more than everything that leaves New Haven, which shows you how important New London is in relation to as a trade port. Okay. So uh, again, you know, what does all of this mean? Um, for New Haven, imports, you know, we're, we're switching from exports to imports. Uh, I was just talking about what's coming out of the, these two major ports. What's coming into them? The imports to New Haven were dominated by three areas. 
there's so there's three principal areas that imports are coming into New Haven. Number one is the West Indies. Number two is New York. And number three is Massachusetts. Obviously, there's big differences here. New York and Massachusetts in proximity to Connecticut, you know, they're, they're directly next to each other, uh, to, to each other. We actually share borders uh, with them. And so uh, those are very close in comparison to the West Indies. And so then you, you look down a little further, it says of the 993 ships entering the port of New Haven, and this is during this five year period, 47% of them came from the islands. Ships from New York were the next most important, 343 or 34%. Massachusetts was third with 189 vessels representing 19%. When you put all three of them together, they account for 94% of all the incoming ships to New Haven, okay? We go back to that 407 number. Uh, the islands, they constituted 16, over 16,000 tons of material. This represents 54% of everything that's coming into New Haven. So my point here is that when you look at both exports and imports, the islands are critical to New Haven. The same is true of New London. Of the 1,710 ships that arrived in New London, a third of them, over 500, came from the West Indies. Of that, you know, there's you know over 54,000 tons that's arriving into New Haven each year. Almost half of it, 46%, is arriving from the Caribbean, from the West Indies. So just like, you know, West Haven or uh, New Haven rather, New London has the same sort of statistics that are going on here. This this critical trade that links um, the West Indies to the state to the colony rather of Connecticut. And so, you know, so now that we have a little idea of, of numbers, of, of what's going out, what's going in, and you can understand the significance of this trade, let's get an idea of what was on these ships that are bound for the West Indies. What's actually going from Connecticut, from New Haven and New London? What's on board all of these many vessel, vessels? And I, you know, you can see the box at the bottom, I say, Remember that every tillable spot on the of land in the islands was reserved for sugar production. They're not growing a thing there. You know, there might be a few vegetable gardens that are for fun here and there, but there's no significant agricultural production in these islands. So everything's coming from outside the islands and primarily from Connecticut. So uh, onions, onions, onion, onion. If you know anything about Weathersfield, you know that Weathersfield is famous for onions, uh, these, these very famous red onions that they produce. And so again, we're talking about these custom records, this 1768 to 72, approximately 482,922 bunches of onions, okay? Now, that's a lot of onions, but what's a bunch of onions? What does that mean? Well, when you're shipping, uh, weights and measures mean everything. Uh, you can't just say, oh, a bunch is this or a bunch is that. They actually pass, the colony passes, an act for regulating the market and ascertaining the weight of bunches of onions. And it said that a bunch had to weigh at least four and a half pounds and was required to be cured, dry, well, and firmly bunched. And those who failed to adhere to either aspect of the new act forfeit either the onions or their value. So this is, you know, when you're talking about trade, this is serious stuff. You can't be sending onions that are fresh out of the ground that have a lot of moisture in them. They have to be cured. They have to be dry. Uh, they have to be bunched in a particular way, and then they send them out. So what does this mean when you're talking about 480 bunches of onions? Well, the approximate weight of all of these onions in this five-year period, it's almost 2 million pounds of onions. I mean, 2 million pounds of onions is a lot of onions today, let alone when you're talking about in this, really this sort of heyday where the maturation of, of, of trade has really developed in Connecticut. So we're, we're talking about a lot of onions. And Weathersfield is famous. It was actually known as Onion Town. And in the top left here, you can see that 
that uh, there's a, this is actually a children's book called The Onion Maiden, and, and women who worked the onion fields in Wethersfield were known as onion maidens. Uh, and the onion maidens, you can see on the right side, the onion maidens who weeded and wept. Uh, and of course, you know, we know why they wept because we, we've all, you know, been in our kitchen and we've all chopped onions and we've all cried a bit. So they were reputed to be the best cooks in the region. Uh, women were critical to onion production, as well as milking cows, churning butter, and making cheese. Also things that went down to the islands. So anything that, you know, is not going to spoil, they're sending to those islands, which includes butter and cheese. So uh, you can see here, you can see on the left, you can see a woman uh, churning uh, milk to make butter. And so we've got butter, butter, and more butter. Uh, we're talking again during this five-year period from 68 to 72, over 44,000 pounds of butter was sent to the West Indies. And it's more than just butter. Connecticut kit ships carried uh, 152,596 pounds of cheese. I would argue today that that is a lot of cheese still. Uh, they also brought approximately 74,470 pounds of tallow, which is uh, cooked down rendered animal fat. Uh, it's packed into containers, into those barrels, those hogsheads, and sent to the plantations where it was used for making candles. So the, uh, again, my point is there is some serious production and shipping that is going on here. Uh, Connecticut livestock during this five-year period. What is sent during this five-year period? Uh, sheep, hogs, cattle, poultry. There are uh, over 27,000 sheep that are shipped in this five-year period. They are used for both food and dung. Uh, when I go down to, to Nevis, I see sheep and goats running all over the place. And I sort of in the back of my mind chuckle to myself and say, you know, I, I wonder if these are uh, you know, these are the, uh, the descendants of Connecticut born sheep and goats. Um, almost half of all the sheep exported from British North America uh, went to the islands. The leading supplier of cattle, three of every four head of cattle that go to the islands came from Connecticut. 20, more than 20,000 barrels of slaughtered beef and pork were sent from Connecticut. The approximate weight of one of these barrels was 220 pounds. That, that totals uh, four and a half million pounds of beef and pork that is sent down there. Now on your left, these images that are there, they're uh, you know, a tiny bit fuzzy because I expanded. These are actually from old maps. I had mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk that I've done a, a bit of stuff with old maps of Connecticut. And what these map makers did is not only did they try to do a, a clear and accurate map of Connecticut in a given period, but they also included images on the map that were important to a particular region. So this particular map is Smith's map of Hartford County. Um, you know, I just showed the, what the, the title area of the map is. I'm not showing you the entire map. But what I also add is, you know, they have in the center of the map, they have the, the state of Connecticut and or of, in this case of Hartford County. And then all along the border, like a picture frame, they have little drawn images of all kinds of things that are important to that county's um, uh, monetary infrastructure. And what do you have pictures of? Hogs, cattle, goats. So we don't today think necessarily of Hartford as a particularly agricultural region, but there was a time when it was very, very agricultural. So our, our next slide uh, is you see there's a highly skilled network that is at work to make all of this happen. And I want to be really clear about this. There is not, it's not like today where we have mega corporations that are producing just massive amounts of agricultural goods that really control the marketplace. It's not like it is today. Uh, it is much more the case of dozens and dozens, really hundreds of small enterprises that are producing materials, all of which is contributing 
to this larger network. So there is also, so you've got uh, farmers, uh, you've got butchers, you've got barrel makers, you've got woodworkers, you've got metal workers. And here you can see in the top left slide, these are coopers. These are people who actually make barrels. And, you know, I don't know, you know, some of you might do a little woodworking. I, I, I love to do woodworking and I'm, I'm actually not too bad at, at it at some things. I can't even begin to tell you how to do the, the math and the geometry to make a barrel that is watertight so that, and, and to make the ring that goes around it perfectly to create a watertight barrel. This was a highly, highly skilled trade that was going on. And in the bottom left, you can see the same thing. You see somebody who's making, you know, planing and making staves and other people who are making the, the, the hoops that go around it and they're putting this whole thing together. And this is, you know, without the creation of these barrels, you, you don't have a way to ship. Uh, and so you've got sawyers um, who are, you know, at the, the mills that they produce during this time period that we're talking about, almost 7 million staves that are key components for barrel making, uh, which are used to ship everything. Uh, a similar amount of hoops, four and a half million hoops are produced. Uh, there are almost 6 million wooden shingles that are created and sent down to the island that are used for roofing on the churches, the distilleries that are making all the rum, all the waterfront shops, the plantation managers, uh, mansions. I mean, this is a massive, massive enterprise. Uh, and there's a highly skilled network, uh, uh, again, of these woodworkers. Uh, you look at this, two million, over two million feet of pine boards are shipped down. 400 and almost 432,000 feet of oak plank, 85,000 feet of oars for, for uh, the, the ships and the small dinghies. Uh, over a million bricks are created from the clay of Connecticut soil and shipped down to build uh, structures in the West Indies. Again, it's just a massive infrastructure that is going on here. Uh, but what's the most valuable Connecticut commodity? So we're talking about all of these various things. And I gave a, I, I sort of, if you've been following, you can probably guess what it is um, because the agricultural goods are important, but remember one of those early ships that sent down by Salston Stahl? You remember what the most valuable commodity was? It's the horses. Horses represented the most valuable item exported to the West Indies, accounting for over 59% of the total value of all goods. And we're still talking about this five year period from 1768 to 1772. 59% of everything that's shipped down there, the value of it, 59% of it is the value of horses. Okay? Every commodity entering or leaving the West Indian ports had to be transported inland, and that required animal power, and the fastest animal power were horses. Uh, other horses were used to drive the rollers to crush the sugar stalks. Um, there were also prize horses were used by the white planter elite that and, and having you know fancy horses symbolized wealth, power, and status. I know that on uh, on Nevis there is a racetrack on the island that has been there for a, a long, long time. I don't know exactly how long, but a long, long time. On the left, you see here this is a, uh, a, a an advertisement. Uh, wanting, you know, it's a call for horses. Uh, and remember that I said that there's this network where you see you've got all of these woodworkers and farmers and all these people producing all these things. There are also people who are the merchants who are involved in collecting all of these goods and then placing them on board these ships. So here you have uh, a, a advertisement in the Connecticut current of the day from William and Joseph Hart and what they want to purchase, a cargo of young, well-made, gay pacing horses from four to six years old. Uh, they are, they're looking for horses. They're looking to sell horses. They wanna buy horses. In the bottom left, what you see there, that is also from the Hartford Current. And it is a, a die, you know, when a printer set 
when you think about producing a newspaper during this time period, every single word, uh, you know, they had specific printer sets for particular words and they had particular letters. They would sometimes, if it was an image they used all the time, they would actually have a metal worker uh, create a die for that image. They're only going to do that if it's something that they want to do all the, that they're using all the time. And here you have an image of a horse. Okay, so horses are important to this period. In the bottom, uh, the the right image there, you can see this is from one of those maps of Connecticut. Uh, again, signifying that horses are incredibly important. Uh, so horses are the great cash crop. And so here on the left, you can see how the horses are, are brought up on board the ships. You know, they're not walking them. You, you know, you might think, well, you know, we have these great wharves that are set up. Well, no, not necessarily. That takes uh, amazing uh, building capacity to build wharves. Where, where the ships can pull right up next to the dock. That is more likely than not, not the case. And it's certainly not the case that they can simply put a plank and bring everything on board. They are using pulleys and winch systems uh, with, with ropes to bring the horses on board. Uh, then in the, the, the lower image, you can see that there is this contraption that they create to hold the horse so it doesn't fall over when it's at sea. And you can see the front legs of the horse are actually tied down what they call hobbling to control the horse's movement. And then the information on the right, you know, again, these custom records that I've been talking about, they show that three of every four horses exported to the West Indies came from Connecticut. Okay, so let me just emphasize that again. Of all the horses that are exported to the West Indies islands, Three out of every four of those horses comes from Connecticut. Okay? Between December 5th, 1772 and January 1st, 1774, this is basically one year, more than a thousand horses were imported to Barbados. So almost a thousand, more than a thousand horses. Of these, 991 of them are from Connecticut. Okay? So again, when I say Connecticut is the key colony, I mean, it's the key colony. Um, ships carrying a rather large number of horses, considering they were kept on the top of the deck through the entire voyage. On average, there were about 31 horses on each vessel uh, that, that are arriving from Connecticut, uh, though they did range from a low of 19, this would have been a, a, probably a smaller ship, to a high of 49. And then this is the real sort of, for me, was a real mind blower when I first saw this chart. This is a chart again that Eric uh, Kimball created uh, and, and that I have duplicated. And here you have all these various colonies that, that exist, these North American British colonies. So you've got Newfoundland, Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, you know, just all the way down the line, all the North American colonies, including Bermuda, all these British colonies, the number of horses that they export. And if you look first at the very bottom in the middle, all these colonies put together, exported almost 30,000 horses. And then if you start from the top middle all the way to the bottom, it shows you exactly how many horses they all shipped. And Newfoundland had exported 45, Quebec had done 24, Nova Scotia, uh, you know, a little over 100, New Hampshire, it suddenly jumps in a big way to 1,000, Massachusetts is 900. Rhode Island, you look at it and you go, oh my gosh, Rhode Island, three, over 3,000 horses. That's a huge amount. And then you look at Connecticut and it puts every other colony into a minimal exporter. 21,000 horses during this period, which, and then you look over to the right-hand column, that's 74% of this 29,000, this 30,000 total of horses that goes down to the Caribbean. It, it's just an unbelievable number. And again, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't think today if you asked people, well, during the colonial period, you know, what was the most important commodity that Connecticut produced during this time period? Would any of you who are listening today have thought it was horses? 
I certainly didn't before I started looking into this information. And I, I still find it pretty, pretty remarkable. So, uh, you know, so that, again, we've talked about exports now. So let's talk about imports. Uh, what's coming into Connecticut? I talked already about the, the tonnage, about the number of ships that are coming in, how much material is coming, but what is it that's coming? And it's from this five year period we're talking about, there are a little over 2,700 ships that come into Connecticut from the West Indies and they brought back four major things, sugar, molasses, rum, and salt. Now, salt is the outlier here. There is a higher salinity content in, in the ocean down in the Caribbean than there it is further up in the Atlantic. It's why you float better. Uh, and it also means that you can get more salt as you know seawater evaporates. You can harvest that salt and you can use it as a commodity. The other three, sugar, molasses, and rum, they're all essentially the same thing, meaning that they all come from sugar cane. You're either shipping the raw sugar, you're shipping the boiled down sugar, uh, which has been created in a molasses, or you're shipping the distilled sugar that has become rum. Okay. And so here you have the numbers, uh, almost a million and a half pounds of brown sugar, uh, over 600,000 gallons of molasses, uh, 1,300,000 gallons of rum, 450,000 bushels of salt. Uh, all of it, every single bit of all this material I just discussed is owned, unloaded on the docks of New Haven and New London, those, those just key ports. And so when you look over to on the left, you see the Sugar Act of 1764 and the lower image it says 1733, this is a symbol, an act of parliament. This is the Molasses Act of 1733. And so parliaments, you know, I mean, if you know the history of the American Revolution at all, you know that the Sugar Act of 1764 is what starts sending colonists over the edge and really causes uh, dissent in the North American colonies, especially in the New England colonies. Well, why does it upset the colonists so much? Because sugar is the key to their economy. And it takes parliament until the 1730s and then 1764 to figure out, you know what? We're not making any money off of these, these colonies of ours. And in fact, the French and Indian War from the 1750s, 1756 to 1763, also known as the Seven Years War, that has cost us, and this is a, a war over North America between Britain and France. That war, at the end of the war, Britain has defeated France and taken over all of North America. You know, we, this is when they get Canada. And they've won, but they have a massive, massive war debt. And they're looking at what they're making off of, of customs duties. And they're going, we're not making any money off of this. In fact, it's costing us money. Therefore, we need to ch change our, our customs policy and our, you know, towards what we know is the cash crop, which is at first they go with molasses and then they pass the Sugar Act of 1764, which includes molasses in it. And so, you I mean, you could argue that as much as sugar is key to the West Indies trade and is key to uh, the, the trade in the West Indies itself, but also of Connecticut, it's also key to the beginnings of the American Revolution. When you think about it, you put it all together. And so here's just a, a few things that I wanted to show you to, to emphasize how important this is. And these are all advertisements from the Connecticut Current. These are you know, taken right from the, the Connecticut Current archives. And you can see New England rum, best New England rum to be sold in their store in Hartford. On the right side, uh, this is New London, 1765. This may notify all people to whom it concerned that pursuant to a decree of the Court of Vice Admiralty, the colony of Connecticut held at New London on the 19th day of June, June instant is to be sold at public venue 
at the house of Captain Edward Pong in Holder at New Holland on the 10th of July next at two o'clock in the afternoon, we're gonna basically auction off a small sloop, uh, burden about 15 tons, also 43 casks of molasses, right? So it's rum, it's molasses, the bottom section, a barrel of good rum, cheap for sale to be sold. Inquire of the printers if you want. So this is, it, it's not just a commodity. It is literally a cash crop. We're not talking about a cash economy here. We're talking about a barter economy and, and sugar and the things that are produced by sugar are key. Well, so what does all this mean? So now, you know, we've gone over, you know, the importance of this trade, how Connecticut is, is just critical to it. Well, there's another component that we haven't touched on. I mentioned it briefly, but the other component of this is, is the workforce, uh, enslaved human beings. The sugar industry is possible in the West Indies only because of the human chattel, the, the commodity that is included in all of this. And that is the transatlantic slave trade. And your top left, you can see um, Africans who have been captured and who are bound together and they're being led uh, in from the interior of Africa to the, the Gold Coast, to the West Coast of Africa, where they're going to be put on board, you know, wide varieties of different nationalities of ships. Uh, and they are going to uh, engage in what is known as the Middle Passage. Uh, and in the bottom right image, you can see the schematic of a slave ship. And these ships are designed to pack human beings together as tightly and as closely as you possibly can. Just like with all those hogshead, those barrels that are created and they wanna have maximized how much they can get on board their vessels because space is money. The same is true of this human chattel. Uh, and, and, you know, when you look at what goes on on some of these slave ships, it is uh, truly horrific. And so there's, there's a pretty amazing database set that you can research. Uh, you, most university libraries have them. It's known as the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. And between 1525 and 1866, there are, uh, it's estimated that there are 12 and a half million Africans who are shipped to the new world. Uh, not all of them survive, uh, you know, 2 million at least, uh, about 2 million of them uh, perish. Uh, they, they don't survive the, 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 the middle passage. About 10.7 million of them make, the, make it across the Atlantic Ocean. And they, di they, they disembark in three places, North America, the Caribbean, which is the West Indies, and South America. And, and below that, you have the specific numbers. 9.7% or less than 10% go to British North American colonies. 14% go to French North American colonies. Okay? The rest, 76% of that 10 million, end up in the West Indies and in Portuguese colonies such as Brazil. Okay? Why such a high number to the West Indies compared to North America? because the sugar mills were, there's no other way to put it, they were death traps, absolute death traps. Sugar was such a valuable commodity, it outpaced everything else. So just like they didn't grow their own food or take care of their own domesticated animals, raising them on the islands and they just focused on sugar production, they did not worry about using up their human chattel, just like they didn't worry about using up their animal chattel, they didn't worry about using up the enslaved peoples that they brought. If they died, they died. Uh, and there are instances of slave owners in North America. George Washington is a good example of this. If there were slave owners who had particularly unruly slaves who caused problems or who ran away a lot, the slave owner would sell them south to the West Indies, to the Sugar Islands. And we know that George Washington did this with at least a couple of troublesome slaves. And so these Sugar Islands are, they, they are death traps. 
Um, when you go there, the likelihood is you you are not going to survive. And so the the replenishment, these these slaves, these 10 million, they don't all come in one time. They come over hundreds of years, and they are you know they're replacing people. Uh, and I know on uh, Navis, you know, I know that island uh, pretty well. And there are all kinds of places in the island that are noted today historically for places where uh, the, the enslaved people would escape the exterior perimeter of the island and go inland to try and survive. Um, and it, it, it's not an easy place. These are rugged, rugged islands. So uh, here you have a map. Um, and I say at the top that it's a flawed map. Um, and you've all heard, I would imagine, of the, the, triang the triangle trade or the triangular trade. This is a, a map from 1752. And the triangle trade was this idea that ships went from the Gold Coast of West Africa uh, and they carried slaves across and, and maybe pepper and some other items into the West Indies. And then from there, they picked up uh, sugar and molasses and rum and all these other things. And they, so they dropped off their slaves in the West Indies. Then they picked up the sugar and all the other stuff and they went up to um, New England. And then from New England, they carried rum and other kinds of things back to the Gold Coast. And they would just continually go in this triangular route. Well, that's not accurate. That's a flawed map. A correct map is this one which is much more, I don't know if it's complicated, but it's much more accurate. And here you have, there is a trade that is going back and forth between the islands and the North American colonies. That's what they're doing. They're not also going to Africa or they're not also going to Europe. There are ships that specialize in going from New England to Europe. There are ships that specialize in going from New England uh, and the Southern colonies to Africa. And there are ships that specialize in going from New England and the North American colonies just to the West, West Indies and back. These are those ships that I emphasize so much in regards to New London and New Haven. So, you know, images of slavery and, and sugar. Here you have, uh, you know, a wonderfully rendered uh, image, colorized image of enslaved peoples carrying, harvesting the sugar cane. You can see in the top right that they're harvesting sugar cane up there. They're carrying it into a, a structure where they are milling it. And here you can see that it is not a water powered mill or an animal powered mill but it is actually powered by the enslaved themselves and they are pushing this giant millstone. And you can see the, uh, the, uh, the enslaved peoples that are shoving the cane down into the, under the mill and what's coming out is the cane juice. And you can see an enslaved person collecting it into a, a big copper kettle and then they carry it over to the fire and they boil it down and then they put it into these, these jars. Um, this is actually a fairly primitive setup that is here. On the top right, you see a much more complex setup. You can see that, you know, it's not a great image, but you get the idea where they've got, uh, you know, it's not just a simple fire that's going. They've got chimneys going, they've got ovens going, they've got, I mean, it, it's a much more enterprising uh, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure that's there. And the bottom right, you can see to be sold. On this Thursday, uh, the 3rd of August next, a cargo of 94 prime healthy Negroes consisting of men, boys, women, girls. So uh, this is, you know, this is the one of the great sins of humanity, something that we know uh, if you watch the news at all over the summer with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the, you know, whatever you think of Black Lives Matter, it is only the most recent iteration of arguing for the, uh, the, the rights of Black humanity. It begins with the abolition movement, runs into uh, 
uh, you know, the, I mean, this is very, very broad, but runs into Martin Luther King. And these are all different evolutions of fighting for uh, justice for uh, people of color. Uh, here's another very, very good image of people planting sugarcane. And if you remember, I had said that they till these islands up as far as they can possibly go. And here you have it where you have the mountainous area up above that you know, they can't plant in rock, but boy, they plant everything else. And here you have both uh, African men and women who are out working the fields and, and planting. Here you have a, a really good image of the interior of one of these sugar mills where you have uh, the fires that are going. This is the interior. I showed you an image before where you could see the fires burning and the chimneys going. Well, this is the interior of that. On the left side, you can see these huge copper kettles. They're basically these large domes that set into the brick infrastructure. The fires are underneath it. They are pouring the, the cane juice into this. And then you can see on the bottom left, here you can see a, uh, a, 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 an enslaved person pouring the cooked down sugar down this trough where it ends up in this large you know, square container where the sugar is then allowed to dry and they break it up as much as they can into the raw sugar form that we understand today. And then they, you can even see a, a, in the, the sort of middle right, uh, somebody who is weighing the sugar. And so this is all you know, weights and measures. Uh, so what, what is Connecticut? What about Connecticut in slavery? And this is where we're, we're starting to, you know, I'm, I'm about to wrap up. Uh, and so what about Connecticut in slavery? Well, on the right side here, and again, we look at these custom records that I've been discussing for the last, you know, 30, 40 minutes. From 1768 to 1772, uh, custom officials recorded slaves imported into Connecticut in only one year, that five-year period, and that was in 1768. 14 slaves came, three to New Haven and eight to New London. Since no ships were recorded arriving from Africa, these slaves must have arrived either from the West Indies or from ships operating along the coastal trade, meaning that these, these 14 slaves that came to Connecticut in 1768, they either came on board West Indian ships or more likely they were bought, brought from an adjoining state, from New York or more likely really from Rhode Island because Rhode Island in New England is the hub of, 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 of slaving, of slave ships. A tremendous number of slaver, slaver vessels are created and sailed out of Rhode Island. And this, however, doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of enslaved people in the colony of Connecticut. And in fact, Connecticut uh, has, at the time of the American Revolution, Connecticut has more slaves, just over 6,000, than any other New England colony. So there are a significant number of slaves. It's just that Connecticut is not a destination for slave ships themselves. They're coming into Connecticut either on other vessels or more likely over the road. Uh, and so we know that there are slaves and we know that there are enslaved people who aren't very happy about being enslaved. On the left-hand side, this is an advertisement from the Hartford Current, the Connecticut Current at the time. And it states, on Tuesday evening, the 20th instant, ran away from my tan work, so a tannery, my Negro man, Jack, aged about 24 years, about five feet and a half high, marked with a large gash across on each cheek and a part of his scalp taken off the back part of his head. He cannot straighten his right little finger. Now we don't know whether that stuff, those injuries occurred as a result of an overseer or the slave owner or whether they were accidents or we, we don't know this, right? But then it says, whoever will take up said servant and return him to me or confine him in some jail shall have all necessary charges paid and be handsomely rewarded. Thomas Denny, 
Wethersfield, October 31, 1785. And then it says, any intelligence about the Negro uh, uh, sent either to Mr. Joseph Webb or me at Wethersfield will be thankfully acknowledged. And you remember when I talked about the, the, the die that was created for the printing and they have the horse that was created and you're only gonna have a, a metal worker create that if there's enough reason to use it often. Well, here you have an etching of a runaway slave and there are multiple different etchings that are used in the Connecticut Current. Cornell University actually has an outstanding slave runaway database that you can look up slave runaway ads from newspapers all over uh, North America, all over the United States. And you can actually search by state or region. And it, it's a remarkable tool if it's something you're interested in. Uh, so, sorry, here we go. So here is a, uh, from a census report in 1782. And this shows the inhabitants of Connecticut also of Indians and Negroes. So this is showing you the population of Connecticut. And if you look at the bottom line, um, the total number of, of whites in Connecticut is 2,200 people, okay? The total number of Indians and Negroes is 6,273. And then it breaks it down by, by town. Uh, really, really, probably more by counties um, than, than towns. But uh, it, it's just, it's, it's remarkable that Connecticut has that many enslaved people. So uh, between 1715 and 1765, approximately 46 Connecticut built ships entered North American ports with slaves for sale. Uh, 37 docked in New York. Most carry less than 10 slaves, but six entries recorded between 10 and 17. So there are Connecticut built ships, Connecticut owned ships that are transporting slaves. But again, Rhode Island is really, there's a, there's a deep history with Rhode Island and the slave trade. Uh, and then, you know, we finally, we wrap up with the West Indies trade, the American Revolution and Connecticut slavery, because they're all tied together in very, very interesting ways. And, and, and how is this, why is this? Um, I had mentioned the Sugar Act of 1764 uh, is the beginnings of dissension. And there is a 10, 12 year period where this dissension increases and we ultimately get the American Revolution. Uh, and America's decision to declare independence from Britain, it, 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 you know, it has a massive impact it meant closing or at least severely limiting access to the West Indies trade because Britain is not going to allow the North American colonies to still have access to its West Indies trade. And the American Revolution goes on for eight years and any colonial ship or new American ship that is plying the Caribbean Sea or the Atlantic is a potential target of British warships. And so this has a really, really big impact on the West Indies trade. I mean, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, it, and I say here, this delivered a severe blow to the Connecticut economy. Uh, and if you think about it, if more than half of all the materials coming from Connecticut, from these two major ports of New Haven and New London are, going, are bound for the West Indies and the West Indies trade is halted, what does it do to Connecticut's economy? Suddenly Connecticut has to refocus its economy in a different way. And historians have debated, well, what does this change do? Is this the thing that causes Connecticut to move away from and shift away from slavery, okay? Because Connecticut, and I'll discuss this in one second, Connecticut gets rid of slavery in 1784, gradually. They pass a gradual Emancipation Act. Well, why do they do it in 1784? the year after the American Revolution is over? Is it because the West Indies trade has been changed so much that they realize they're not gonna be able to rely on sugar and slavery any longer? And so the key question becomes, is the degree to which ending slavery was a result of, of this economic circumstance or did it have to do with this concept of the equality of man and 
the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal? And is, is it that? Is it morality and philosophy or is it economics? And this is a question that has just stymied historians for a long, long time and they've debated it. I actually have a, uh, uh, a graduate student right now who is working on a master's thesis and he is discussing exactly this issue. He's looking into exactly this issue and I think it's gonna be a really important thesis that he's producing. So, and, and here's just the information on the Gradual Emancipation Act. Uh, 1784, Connecticut General Assembly passed a bill for the gradual emancipation of slaves. All slaves born after March 30, March 1, 1784, would be free at the age of 25. And so what this means, if you were a slave before March 1, you're a slave in perpetuity. They're not freeing everybody, only the people who are born after the act when they get old enough. This is to lessen the economic impact of freeing slaves. And it's also to lessen the impact of suddenly releasing 6,000 enslaved people into Connecticut society all in one shot. Connecticut doesn't get rid of slavery completely where they abolish it totally until 1848. And it's the last state in New England to do it. At that time, I think there's something like 17 slaves left and they're all very, very old. But uh, it, it's just a remarkable history. And so finally, and this is it, um, there's a reason that Connecticut was in an excellent position to become the provisions state during the American Revolution. And one of Connecticut's nicknames is the provision state. Uh, and why is that? Because suddenly they're not able to send all of these food materials to the Caribbean. And instead the network of farms, the trade workers, the transportation that had been developed for the West Indies trade, all of that they divert it to the Continental Army and to other colonies during the American Revolution. So all of this stuff about sugar and the West Indies trade, it's all bound up together in this much bigger concept. You know, if you can think of the West Indies trade and the production of sugar as the microcosm of this story, but it fits into the macrocosm of the larger issue of, of economics and politics and revolution. And when you put it all together, it's, it's a pretty fascinating story. So I am going to stop that. I'm going to start my video. I'm going to pull my camera up and I'm going to say that's my talk and I hope you learned something. I hope you found it as interesting as I do. And the, the, the last thing, I'll, I'll see if there's any questions in just one second, but the last thing I'm going to ask you to do is if you enjoyed this talk, please, please, please support the Madison Historical Society, okay? <laughs> because our historical societies are what keep our history alive. And especially in these times right now where our economy is so bad and we've got COVID going on and all of these challenges, our historical societies, if you love history, our historical societies need us more than they ever have. So if you like the talk, um, write a check. So let's see what we got for chat here. Uh, Population figures are just for colonists and not for indigenous peoples. Is that right? Generally speaking, yes, it's just for colonists, except for when they get to later and they start making more uh, extensive in, in the later period. Um, was the Westport and Western Connecticut area sending onions to the West Indies? This area was known for onion growing. Thank you. I'm not actually sure of that. That's a very good question. I would imagine that that they are. It's, it's not Weathersfield that's producing 2 million onions in a five year period all by itself. So I would imagine that they are. I actually lived in Weston for a number of years and I graduated from um, Staples High School in Westport. Um, uh, I went to a race meeting in Barbados in the 1990s. Uh, today it is so amazing that sugar was so valuable is certainly not the case today. When did this change? This changed when uh, agriculture was able to shift to using the sugar beet to produce sugar, which was much easier to grow, much less uh, of a production that went with it. So that's what changes the sugar culture. Um, why was Connecticut so dominant in this trade? Other coastal colonies were much closer and seemed to have had horses, farms, et cetera, too. Why trade all the way up here for commodities that could be bought closer? Really the number one answer to that is that Connecticut is so early 
in the development as a colony. If you think about it, Connecticut and Massachusetts are the first North American colonies that are created. Okay? And because they don't have quite the agricultural cash commodity that other colonies, so if you think about Virginia and Maryland as two of the Southern colonies that are most critical to agriculture, they start, they, they try a bunch of different cash crops, but they're not finding anything that is really valuable until they come across tobacco. And tobacco becomes hugely, hugely popular. And that becomes the number one cash crop. Connecticut is ahead of the curve on most other colonies in developing a trade network. And again, we don't think of Connecticut as a particularly agricultural state today, but back in the day, it was hugely agricultural. And um, if you go hiking in Connecticut, uh, you will see the stone walls everywhere. Well, why are those stone walls all over the place? Because they were tilling the soil and pulling those stones out of the ground, getting them out of the way. And if you imagine, you, you know, go back into some of these areas of Connecticut today that are so heavily forest, Connecticut looks today more like it did when English colonists and Europeans first arrived than it ever has in the last 400 years. Because when the colonists arrive, they start clear cutting everything so that they can breed agriculture and they can use all the wood materials for export and creating ships and houses and all of the, this wood and all this stuff. So Connecticut is actually more forested than it has been since the early colonial period. And it's one of the reasons why we have so much wildlife coming back to the state with bears coming back. And, you know, it, 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 again, all of this stuff is connected. Um, and then we have from uh, Dennis Culleton, who is our next speaker, uh, who is also fantastic. And you've got to listen to the Witness Stone Project. He says, thank you, Professor Warshow. It was a great pleasure to hear you speak. Thank you, Dennis. Um, and we, CCSU is working with Dennis to become one of the partners of the Witness Stone Project, which is really cool. And then follow, finally, how can we follow up with you to get a few of your citations and slides? Thank you for sharing contact info. If anybody is interested in what I have talked about um, this evening, you are more than welcome to send me an email. I am super easy to find. Just Google my name or look at the CCSU History Department. I am more than happy to share this PowerPoint with you um, and any, any other information that you would like. So uh, happy, happy to, I missed a question. Will the recording be shared? Well, that one just popped up. I see it now. Um, Yes, I told Jenny that she has recorded this lecture. I told her that she's more than happy to use the recording uh, as she would like. Uh, if you want to go through and listen to me again. Um, Matt. You're a, a patient soul. <laughs> Matt, can you hear me? I'm so I know. Hey, Matt. I'm so glad to have you. I think that Mary Donnelly is alerting us to her question about the native inhabitants of Barbados. Oh. She'd love to know who were the native inhabitants and what was their role in the sugar production? There's not much role of the native inhabitants in sugar production. The original in inhabitants of the Caribbean islands, the two primary tribes, one were the Arawak, Indians and the other were Carib Indians. And if you go down to the West Indies, uh, you can enjoy a local uh, Carib lager beer, which is named after the Carib Indians. Most of those tribes were wiped out along with so many of the other indigenous cultures all throughout the Caribbean, Central, South America uh, by uh, arriving Europeans and the conquistadors. Uh, the, you know, cultural anthropologists estimate that from the time of Columbus's arrival to within a uh, hundred years uh, that there is a detop depopulation rate of well, well over 90%, which is just remarkable. And I, I wanna make very, very clear, there's a lot of people who, you know, Columbus is a controversial figure today and whether or not we should be celebrating Columbus Day. Uh, there have been questions of whether Columbus's statue in Hartford should be taken down, um, uh, whether Columbus statue in other 
Connecticut towns should be taken down and that he was involved in genocide. Um, Columbus was very harsh towards uh, native peoples. He was very harsh towards his own crew. But I don't, my personal belief is I don't believe you can call it um, active genocide, a, an attempt to wipe out the entire culture. The vast majority of these peoples, uh, these native peoples who die, they die as a result of, um, of lack of immunity to European disease. And the vast majority of these people die without ever seeing a European. The, 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 we, are we familiar with cultural pandemics today? Imagine a cultural pandemic that instead of uh, like COVID killing 1.7% of people, it infects, imagine it killing 90 seven percent of the people that it infects because you have no antibody to it at all so uh, i think that answers the question um remarkable do you see the last one matt yes is there evidence of enslaved people on the kinetic vessels to help manage the cargo coming or going to the west indies yeah i had mentioned that briefly there's a there's some connecticut ships that are carrying enslaved people there are connecticut vessels that are involved in this um uh, there is a very, very good book called Complicity, if you are interested, uh, that my friend Ann Farrow, she was a, a journalist for the Hartford Current. She and a few of her, uh, uh, of her colleagues wrote a really, really good article for Northeast Magazine in the Hartford Current. This has got to be eight years ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, called it's one of our lecturers as well, Matt. After Compl Complicity came out, oh and, yeah, yeah, of course. And, and, and a lovely and, talk for us. Anne is a great speaker. She's a yes. lovely person. She wrote this book, Complicity, and she was shocked to go into Connecticut archives and find um, ships logs from Connecticut ships that were going back and forth to the Gold Coast and carrying enslaved peoples. I mean, this is a really, really um, dark period in Connecticut history, in American history, in human history. Um, uh, it's a, also very, very complicated and far more complicated than either the left or the right in American politics today would like to make it seem. Um, it, it, it's more nuanced. Uh, and I don't mean that to in any way dismiss the enslavement of human beings. Uh, but it, it, when you're talking about human history overall, uh, it's complicated. There, there's a lot of places in the world that uh, we still don't treat people, human beings don't treat people very well. And there are plenty of American policies, both domestically and foreign policy that are rather harsh, not on the scale of, you know, 10 million people, right? But still extremely problematic. So anything else I can answer or comment upon? So Martha would love to follow up. Do you see that, Matt? Uh, yeah, it says to follow up, I wondered if they were missed in some of the stats because there were workers as enslaved people on board. Thanks for complicity. Yeah, absolutely. There's there, no question. We don't, these records aren't perfect. And you remember I referenced the um, 1768 to 1772 database, the customs database. That is such a great database because it is in fact so complete customs records go missing and the, sometimes they get destroyed and you know we're, we're never going to know uh, for certainty what happens to everybody you know that's the difficulty but you know new information comes out you know all the time uh, and you know when when people see those runaway slave ads I showed you a couple of them from the Connecticut current and there's from other Connecticut newspapers from this time period I can't even begin to tell you how shocked people are. My students and others, when I give other talks, when they go, wait a minute, that's from a Connecticut newspaper? They just, we just don't think of Connecticut as being connected to slavery. 
And if you're really interested in this, you know, pick up a copy of, of my book that Jenny mentioned at, at the front side of this, uh, Connecticut in the American Civil War, which talks about the history of slavery in Connecticut, um, the history of race in Connecticut, and how it all is connected to uh, the Civil War, how it is and how it isn't connected to the Civil War. Because again, uh, you know, we often think, and I tell my students this, especially my students who are going to become teachers, I, I tell them all the time, people attempt, a lot of people, I think, attempt to decomplicate history and say, oh, well, this is what history is. And, you know, and I, I often say, look at the complexity of our society today, how complicated it is and how difficult it is to just give a, oh, it's this or it's that that there's so many variables in it. That's not different than other societies in the past. It, it's complicated. People, human beings are complicated and therefore it's natural that their stories and their history are gonna be complicated. Matt, we, we wanna thank you for this wonderful talk. I, um, I consider you part of the Madison Historical Society family. Thank you. At this point, we're very fond of you and very grateful for your scholarship. And um, I think uh, Jenny will join me in just saying how much we appreciate the way that you've made it very clear to us today that there's um, historical evidence all over the place for these stories. Some of it discovered, some of it undiscovered, as you've, as you've just said. And I know that our other speakers in the series will uh, add to your thoughts and to your uh, sensitivities and sensibilities about uh, this history and its nuances. We'll, uh, we'll certainly explore that. And we can't wait to hear our other speakers and to have you back with us again someday. Well, thanks so much, Doe, and thank you, Jenny, as well. And I, I always love working with the Madison Historical Society. And I'll, I'll leave you with enjoy your the new year, and let's hope for a better year than 2020, and support the Madison Historical Society. <laughs> thanks for thank that. Thank you so very much, and Doe, thank you for for jumping in since I'm also dealing with uh, some family stuff. But thank you all so very much. Year forty years. Thanks so much. Alrighty, take care. Take care. Good night, everyone. Thanks Good for night. coming. Thank you.